Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, so let us start. Okay, any questions from last time? Any questions? So last time we looked at decidability of many different uh, languages. For example, if we looked at uh, ADFA, we looked at ANFA, we looked at a regular expressions. Uh, then what did we look at? We look at EDFA, E2 DFA, then we look at ACFG, ECFG, and E2, E2. Right, these are the sum of the languages which we looked at it, and uh, we concluded that all these languages are decidable. So today we will look at some other uh, languages. And if everything is clear, then we will go ahead. But before uh, we go there, uh, last time I told you that, that we have some hierarchy. And that hierarchy is that we have regular languages, the heart, and then we have context-free languages. Then we have uh, Turing decidable languages. And then we have outside all of them, Turing recognized. Right. Okay, so these are all the hierarchy of. Uh, I mean, different kinds of languages that we know. And we know that there are a few things which are outside being recognized. So some languages are outside here, which are not. These languages are these languages are Not even Turing recognized. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, any questions till that point? No. No, sir. Okay. So, okay. so from this point onwards, we will look at something which are, so, so far we have been looking at languages which are decidable, right? So we have been looking at languages which are decidable, right? Now we will look at languages which are not decidable. So we will call them undecidable, which means not decidable. So we will look at some of the languages which are not decidable. But before we go there, so let me uh, let's talk about two things. So we know that computers are very powerful. Okay, the computers are very powerful. So let me copy something and I will paste it here.
sorry. So can you read it? Is it readable? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so we know that um, suppose we are given a computer program and we are also given a precise specification of, the, of, of what that program does. So for example, we are given a program and that program is written in some particular programming language, uh, for example, in Java. And so we have a Java program. But if you use C++ program. Okay. And let's say A is the name of the program. A is a C++ program that sorts a list of numbers. Okay. okay. So, so let us try to formally define what does it mean by a CC plus program uh, that sorts a list of numbers. Uh, so say, let's say we say A is the program. Okay. And A is used as input. So let's say input of A is an array or a list of n numbers. Okay. Let's say all of them are U64. It doesn't have to be, but just imagine that all numbers are U64, unsigned 64 digits. And uh, let's imagine those numbers are, those numbers are A1, A2, and so on. Okay. What do you want uh, from this program? You want from this program is that you want a throughput that is a sorted, a sorted permutation So let's say this is our input. Let's call it alpha. Sorted permutation of alpha. Okay. A sorted permutation of an alpha would be a permutation. Let's call it a prime, such that a prime would be sum a1, ai1, ai2, and so on, such that ai1 is less than or equal to ai2. Now, you must have some program over here. So there will be some specifications here and, and, and the execution code, but this is exactly what you want. So you want your input to be like this and you want your output to be like this, right? So this is a very precise, this is very precise description of what your program does. It does not matter if it is a C, C++ program or a Java program or a program in any, in any other programming language. So we have a very precise description or a definition uh, of the program that what does this program do? And we also have uh, written down the program in such a way that it exactly does what it says. So we have already checked that the program is correct. Okay, so we know the program. So since both the program and the specifications are mathematically precise objects, so, so we might uh, believe or we hope that uh, we can automate the process of verification by feeding this informa information to some computer program. 
Okay. Uh, by verification, I, I, I mean that, that, uh, that suppose we write another program here, we do not know what this program is, and we pass this A to this machine. M is a machine or a program. Okay. And this program, this machine M checks A. Okay. It checks A. And what does it mean by checks A? It verifies that A does exactly what it is supposed to do. By looking at the specifications. And you know that the specifications are mathematically very precise objects. So we hope and we assume that there must exist such machine or such program which when when looks at a program or any other program for that matter given its logical mathematical description and specification it verifies that it does exactly what it is supposed to do and not only that that it it i mean so okay so so there are two parts uh, the second part we will talk about second part later the first part is that it just verifies that what it does is exactly what it says, right? So we call it software verification. Okay. And, and we might assume that with, with the advancement in computer science and, and with powerful computers that we have, uh, one might be able to come up with such a program M which does this job, right? But the thing is, the answer is unfortunately no. Unfortunately, we cannot create right such a So this M machine cannot be constructed, cannot be written, cannot be designed such that for any arbitrary program A, it just verifies that this program does exactly what it's supposed to do. Okay. So it means that the point of this, this whole discussion is that computers, even though are very powerful, uh, but they cannot do some things. And there exist unsolvable problems. So there exist uh, situation, there exist problems for which there is no computational solution. And this is one of those problems. So the software verification is the first thing that we have to talk about. Second thing that we will talk about is the halting. Okay, I will explain about this halting uh, later on, uh, but you have but keep it keep this thing in mind. Okay, we will talk about this later. So this software verification, unfortunately, there is no such concept. There is no such machine which we can write, design, uh, which sir? Has... yes. So for M, can't we repeat the exact same steps that we did in A, and uh, just make uh, check counter. Uh, any other steps are being followed or not? If any changes are not made, then it means that A was successful. No, I, I did not get your question. It was, um, I could not hear it properly. Can you repeat your question slowly? So what I'm saying is, uh, for example, in A, if it is a sorting problem, then in uh, this sorted solution, we can try and sort it again. And if there's, if more sorting happens, then it means that A is performing fine. Good. Uh, but the thing is that M is a general computer. Okay. M is a general computer. So M does not know that A sorts. M has to decide, M has to find it out that A is a sorting program. So what we would do actually, so we will actually send two things. So this machine M will receive the program A Okay, and it will receive specification of it. That what this program does. Okay, and then it will decide 
Yes, yes, correct. So it is acceptable or or not. Okay. M is a general general. computer. It does not know what kind of program it will receive. So A, when I say that A is a general uh, is a sorting program, so we know it's a sorting, program, right? Uh, but in general, it can be anything. It could be A, it could be M itself, right? Right. So I can give. So for example, I can write a program, and I say this program is basically M. So right, let's say I, I create a C C plus plus file. So let's say this is M dot CPP. I pass it to C GCC. I get M dot out, right? Or M dot exe. Let's say M dot exe. And now with this M dot exe, I send M dot cpp. And I also give the description of M. Will it be? Will it accept? Itself or reject? That's a big question. And my claim is that no, it's impossible to write such a program. And we will see that why it is, it is impossible. Okay. So the first result that we will tackle here, it's a theorem. Okay. Before we go there, uh, before we go there, let me write a, a theorem that we have done already. So we know that ADFA, which is defined like this, but given any description of a DFA B and a string W such that B is a DFA and W is a string accepted by, we prove that ADFA is decided. We proved it last time, right? So this is the theorem. Now we have a new theorem. Okay. And before we go to that theorem, let me say there is a language which we call ATM. Okay. So this A in ATM refers to acceptance and this TM refers to turing machine. So we define this ATM as, as a language that contains the description of a turing machine M and a string W such that M is a turing machine. Okay. Okay. And M accepts okay. So we have a theorem. This theorem says we will prove it, but not now. It will require us to develop some tools. And the theorem says that ATM is undecided. ATM is also called the halting problem. We will talk about it in detail. Any questions so far? So when we say that ATM is undecidable, so I'm not going to give a proof right now. I'm just trying to explain that what does it mean by saying that this ATM is undecidable. So remember that when, when we were trying to prove that a, a, ADFA is, is decidable, we said, okay, let's construct a, let's construct a Turing machine uh, which receives description of B, and then it stimulates the working of DFA B, and then it passes W, the string W to, to that DFA. And if that DFA accepts, we say it accepts, 
if that DFA rejects, we say that reject. So that is accepts and reject will be for this entire string, right? So let us try to construct su such a Turing machine uh, for this ATM as well and see that uh, what are the problems. Okay, so this is not the proof, this is just in the direction of the proof. So let's consider U is a Turing machine. And we will come back to this U, why do we name, why did we name it U? So U, let's imagine that U is a Turing machine and U recognizes ATM. Okay, so we will create a machine U which recognizes ATM. So what will be the input to you? On the input M and W, what does Turing machine do? So we know that M is a Turing machine. Okay, and W is a string. Okay, what will happen? So this Turing machine U will simulate M on input W. Okay. If M ever enters its accept state, okay. So we accept it. If M ever enters in its eject state, we eject. Okay, and that's it. Is this in clear? Do you think that this M will recognize uh, this ATM or not? Sorry, this U will recognize this ATM or not? So my claim is My claim is that you will recognize ATM. Is this claim correct or incorrect? Yes, anyone? Sir, I think it's correct. Correct? So why it is recognized and why it is not decided? So what if the input is too large and the machine enters a loop and it never produces an answer? Exactly. For example, when we say that this is the input, right? So MW is the input. So MW, we, we have put them uh, put MW in, in these angle brackets. So these angle brackets means that we have sent a description of the Turing machine M and a string W separated by, by some special. So what what this U will do, it will simulate the machine M, which is given as its description. So it will create this machine M inside U and it will pass this W to the machine. Now we do not know what kind of this, what kind of Turing machine this M is. This Turing machine could be a decider. It could be a recognizer. So it is possible that, that the machine that, that was given as the input to this U was a machine that decides a language. Or it is also possible that the machine is, is a machine which recognizes the language, it does not decide. Now, if it decides, for example, if M is a decider, we know that for every input that is sent to M, M will fold, right? M will come to a stop. It will either stop in an accept state or it will stop in a reject state. But it will eventually stop because M is a decider. But that guarantee is not given here, right? So we do not know what kind of machine this M is. M could be a decider. M could be a recognizer. So if M is a decider, fine. Our machine U will give us an output. That output will either be accept. So that will be either accept the whole thing MW or reject the whole thing M. Right? But there's a problem. And that problem is that the machine M could be a recognizer. And if, if machine M is recognizer, it may loop on W, right? 
it may on on this input mw it may loop on w right so w is a string such that machine cannot decide uh, if if the w belongs to the language of m or not so it will go into an infinite loop if it goes to an infinite loop we will always be stuck in the step number two because step number two is just waiting step for the machine u. So it is waiting for m. So machine u is waiting for mach machine m to produce an answer, right? If the answer to the machine is accept, it will accept. If the answer from machine m is reject, it will reject. So let me draw it uh, in, in picture. So suppose we are trying to create u, right? So we are trying to create a u. Imagine this is u. this u receives input as m when this machine so this machine is u when this machine receives this dub input it will simulate it will create a new machine m and send w to this machine now this machine will give us two outputs which is accept so i would just write a one for accept and zero for uh, how to check and this is for accept in this so when the machine M says accept, it will accept. When the machine M says reject, it will reject. But the problem is that M machine, let's imagine, let's take this machine M outside, uh, outside this machine U. When it receives W, it is possible that M may accept W. It is possible that M may reject W. But it is also possible that M may So if it accepts, fine. If it rejects, fine. So if it accepts, we'll accept. If it rejects, we will reject. But if it goes to infinite loop, it, if it loops forever, this machine, you will always be waiting for an output from the machine. And since no output is coming from M, so no output from U. Therefore, U will also loop whenever M loops. Right, so this is the problem. You get this problem, right? And this suggests that U recognizes ATM. Okay, this U recognizes. ATM. We haven't yet proved that U or no such machine U can decide it, but so far so good. So far, we have just seen that you recognize this ATM. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. So one may argue that, that one may argue that since there are two possibilities for M to be in that it accepts the rejects or it may go into a loop. So when it accepts or reject, we just accept or reject for you. But when it goes to the to, to an infinite loop, somehow, somehow you predict that. And M is stuck in, in a loop. If it can predict, if it can find it out, if there is an algorithm inside you which tells you that M is stuck in an infinite loop, then M will stop the working of M and it will just reject. But unfortunately, such an algorithm is impossible to design. And that is the answer to the or, or the proof that ATM is undecided. And we will, we will see that why it is. We will see that why. Uh, but before we go there, we call this machine U. This U refers to universal viewing machine. Okay, with this universal machine, I, uh, I mean, it reminded me one thing that when I was grading, I'm not sure, I, it was, I think, quiz number two, uh, that some students use universal viewing machine. And I was like, we haven't yet uh, 
uh, talked about universal computing machines and how can you are using universal computing machine. So I don't, I don't know. Anyway, so U is called a universal computing machine. And why do we call universal computing machine? Because U is powerful enough. U is powerful enough to simulate any computing machine. That's a big achievement, for example. Okay, for example, if I say that I have a C++ compiler, C++ compiler is basically a program, right? And I can, and, and this is a program which allows us to compile programs written in C++ program. So suppose I have the C++ program, the executable C++ program, let's say GCC. This GCC, whenever it receives some, let's say, a dot, uh, a dot CPP, it produces A dot out, right? A dot out is the executable file. You may call it A dot EXE as well. So this GCC compiler or any C++ compiler will compile the input file and produce an executable file. Imagine that there are no uh, syntax errors. And then we can execute that executable file and see what, what it does. Now, this GCC compiler is powerful enough that it can receive a GCC, it can receive a C++ file such that it can receive gcc.cpplus file and it will it will output gcc.exe or gcc. And this gcc.exe is a compiler itself. So you can compile the compiler by its right. So it's it's a it's a powerful machine. It's a powerful program, and that's exactly what is the status of this universal Turing machine. The universal Turing machine is a powerful machine. It's a powerful Turing machine that it just requires the description of any Turing machine and whatever description, whatever I mean, description of whatever Turing machine you will send to you, it will simulate it. So it is capable of simulating another Turing machine from within itself. So we call it a universal Turing machine. So universal Turing machine, the concept of universal Turing machine was first proposed by Alan Turing in 1936 uh, when he was uh, when he was actually giving away this uh, this concept of Turing machines. He actually created a universal Turing machine. He said that uh, when so if you remember when we started talking about Turing machines, I said that imagine there's a mathematician sitting. Inside, inside, um, inside the room, and he or she is receiving just a long, um, I mean, roll of papers divided into blocks, and the mathematician can read anything from the blog and write anything on the blog, and it can internally move any to any uh, state, right? And with that, that can that mathematician can compute anything. And then later on, I said that it is also not important that we have a human mathematician. We can replace a human mathematician with a machine. That machine is basically the universal human. So we can, rather than having one human who is going to interpret, we can create a machine powerful enough, which when receives the description of another Turing machine, it will simulate the Turing machine, and then it will work on that machine. So, so regardless what, what is the Turing machine, you just have this universal Turing machine, and you just provide the description of a machine M, and it will do exactly what it needs to do. Is this thing clear? Okay, so there are many. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir, I have a question. Yes. Sir, uh, universal Turing machine, can it simulate only one Turing machine at a time, or like can it simulate multiple Turing machines? What do you mean by that one or multiple? Like as in uh, two Turing machines, like instead of one math machine, we are simulating two math machines uh, yeah, encoding at one time. Does um, that work? Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, of course. Uh, but the thing is that before I answer it, I would like to know why they want that thing. Is there any, any specific thing that you would like to solve? by that answer or no, no. it was it was just a thought it was just a thought yes it is possible it is possible as long as the number of turing machine it uh, simulates is a constant number yes it, it is okay. so 
what you Thank can you, do, sir. you can create a new Turing machine M, okay, which contains two universe, two copies of universal Turing, right? Now it can simulate two Turing machines. Now you can have two inputs here, let's say A and B. So A is a description of a Turing machine here, B is a description. So you pass A to U1, pass B to U2, and now you have two solutions, right? Yeah, it is possible. Okay, so Thank let's come back you. to our theorem. It says that ATM is undecided. We are still not in a situation in a situation where we can prove this theorem because we need to prove uh, we need to come up with uh, some other tools. So we will develop those tools before we can. Prove it. Okay, the proof of this theorem, the ATM is undecidable, or the undecidability proof of ATM uh, uses a technique which we call diagonalization. We will use this diagonalization technique to prove that ATM is undecidable. So diagonalization technique is a mathematical technique. It was discovered and used by a mathematician, uh, George. Cantor in 1873. Okay. In I will talk about it, uh, what, what this diagonalization proof was, but what Kenter was interested in, he was interested in knowing the differences in sizes of different infinite. And interestingly, when Kenter came up with this technique in his proof uh, about the about these differences and presented to mathematicians, most mathematicians of his time uh, did not approve. And they said that it is, it is purely abstract. It doesn't make any sense. It's useless. Uh, it is not connected with real mathematics and so on. So there were so many negative, uh, I mean, things attached with, with this result. Uh, but later on mathematicians found that it is not just useful or important. Uh, this is indeed the fact that that we know that some sets are infinite and but not all infinite sets are same okay uh, so the thing is the question is that if you have two infinite sets how can we tell that whether one set is bigger than the other set uh, for example if i have a set a uh, let's say any set a and that contains let's say a b c d and e right i have another set b which contains let's say one two three four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, and 10. Okay, now <clears throat> I can ask this question. Uh, does, so do sets A and B have the same size? And when we talk about the size of a set, we say the cardinality. cardinality of a set and cardinality of set means number of elements in a set, right? But this is very easy if both the sets are finite because we know that A is finite set, B is a finite set. So if both sets are finite, you can just count the number of elements in both the sets. So we can see that the number of elements in A is equal to one, two, three, four, and five and number of elements in B is equal to 10, right? So five is not equal to 10. Therefore, size of A is not equal to size of, right? So A is not of the same size as the set B. So we can figure it out if both the sets are finite. But what happens when we have two sets which are infinite? So the problem arises when we have 
to infinite set. Okay. For example, just consider the, the set E, which is a set of all even numbers, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. So this set E contains all possible even positive even numbers. Non-negative even numbers. Right? And let's say we have another set O, which can contains all positive odd numbers. One, three, five, and seven, and nine, and so on. Right? Let's say we have another set N, which contains all natural numbers. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. We clearly know that set N is set E, union set O. And we clearly know that set E intersection O is an empty set. Is an empty set because there are no common elements between E and O. So the question is, so the question is, what are the sizes of the set E, set O, and set N? Are these three sets of same size or different? Okay, if different, then what's the difference? And why? Similarly, if they are of the same size, then why? So this was these were the questions which Kenter posed. And then he eventually came up with an answer and, uh, and we, will, we will talk about that answer. So before we go and prove it, uh, can anyone explain that? What do you think about the sizes of these three sets? They're all infinity, but different sizes. E is in finite set, O is in finite set, and N is in finite set. So do you think that the number of elements in set E has any relationship with number of elements in O and number of elements in N? Is it okay to say that the number of elements in E and O are same and the number of elements in N are more than O? Or should we say that number of elements in N is same as the number of elements in E or O? Any, what do you think? Can anyone think about it? Sir, N as, a, uh, as N uh, is in uh, union of E and O, so uh, N might be greater in size. So I will write this question precisely. Does N contain more elements? There are two answers, either yes or no. Yes. What do you think? Which is the right answer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Anyone who said, anyone else who said yes? We have just one person who said yes. Anyone who says no? Anyone in the class who says that no and does not contain more? Anyone? Yeah, the answer is no. This is the correct answer. Yes is not a correct answer. Okay, and I will show you why it is the case. So my question is, did you study this thing in discrete maths or not? So if you do study this thing, if you studied this thing in discrete math and you don't remember, that's perfectly fine. But if you did not study this thing in discrete math, then that's a problem. Did you study it in discrete math or not? Okay, I assume no. Okay, so let, let me give you a very simple reason why 
this, these three sets are of the same size. So let's take the set N. This set N contains one, two, sorry. It said contains zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, right? Now for every element that you have here, okay? Every element that you have here, just create a function f that takes an element n and it gives you another set. Let's say it gives you n. And this function f is defined as so whatever you get, if whatever that you get from here, just multiply it by two. When you multiply zero by two, what you what do you get? Zero. When you multiply one by two, what do you get? Two. When you multiply two by two, what do you get? Four and six, then eight, and then 10, and then 12, and so on and so forth. For every element that you will find in N, you will find an element in set E. And this seems like the set E. For every element that you find here, let's say N, you will find two N here, right? And for every element two N that you find here, you will find N here. So it means that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between these two sets and the number of elements are mapped, the number of elements of set N are mapped exactly to one element at a time to the set E. So it means that the number of elements in N and O, uh, N and E are, are the same. Exactly same kind of function can be written for, uh, for, the, set, uh, for the set O as well. And you say that G is a function which is defined as, to n plus one, okay? So you multiply zero by two, you get zero. Zero plus one is one. You multiply one by two, so you get two. Two plus one is three. You multiply two by two, you get four. You add one, you get five, and so on. So for every element that you have here, you have an element here. And this seems like the set O. So it means that the set E and the same element as the set O, as well as the elements in N. So all these three sets have same cardinality. Have same cardinality. But this seems arbitrary, right? So we, for this, we have a result and this result, and this is due to Kenter. Uh, this result says that, that if you have, imagine that you have two sets A and B. Okay. Suppose you have two sets A, A and B. And suppose you have a function F. Okay. So before that, I will define uh, these things. Suppose you have a function F, which is between A and B. We call this function, we call this function F one-to-one -one function. We call it one-to-one -one function. And when do we call it one-to-one -one function? If it never maps two different elements to the same place. Okay, that is f of a is not equal to f of b whenever a is not equal. So we call such a function one-to-one -one function. Okay. So we say that f is onto function. Okay. f is onto function if it hits all elements of B. That is, there is no element, element B in the set B, such that F of A is not equal to B for some A. Okay, that is it hits, Yes. Okay. Now we say that F, so we have two, two types of function. 
uh, one is the one to one function and the other is on to function. Okay, there is another one and uh, there is, we call it one to one correspondence. Or it is also sometimes called bijective function. We say f is bijective if f is both one to one and on. Okay. So we say that if f is bijective or correspondence, then a and b same cardinal. Okay. They have the same cardinal. Yes. So we have other names for them, uh, injective and subjective function, and then we have bijective function. So they are, they are, uh, I mean, other names for it, right? So injective for one to one, subjective for on to, and bijective for one to one and on. So we say that two sets have uh, two sets have exactly the same size if there exists a bijection or correspondence between the, those two sets. So let's go back to our definition of set n and set e. Set n consists of zero, one, two, and so on, and set e consists of zero. Two, four, six, and so on. Right? So I can construct a bijection between n and e such that my bijection is f of n is 2n. I know that we can prove, we can show f is both on to and one to one. That is, f is both. Injective, which is the exactly right. Subjective, and injective. Okay. Why? Because we know that if I if I put the set N here and I put the set E here, I know that no two elements map to the same element. So whenever there is a mapping, we know it's unique. And it's not just unique onto and and one to one tells us that we can find a reverse mapping, right? So if this is F, we can we can find F inverse. So if it is N and if it is E, we can map from here to here, which F inverse. So we, we know this is a function. And this is the inverse function. Okay, so this projection actually entails that an inverse exists. And whenever an inverse exists, we can map each and every element uniquely here, and we can map each and every element uniquely here. So there's a kind of if and only if relationship, right? So we say that two sets have the same size if those two sets, if there is a bijection between those two sets. Now, the result that we are interested in is called that the set of natural numbers So we know the set of special numbers is infinite. Okay, why we define that set of natural numbers n is countably infinite. And what do we mean by countably infinite? We define this countably infinite.
a set S is called countably infinite if there exists a bijection F from set of natural numbers to Inverse of a function may not be a function, but inverse of a, a bijective function is always a function. That's why we require that it is both onto and uh, one to one, uh, because if the function is both onto and one to one, we know that the inverse must exist. Okay, a set, a set S is called countably infinite if there exists a bijection between the set of natural number and S. Every such set which has the same number of elements as the number of elements in natural numbers is called countably infinite. The set of even numbers is countably infinite, set of odd numbers is countably infinite. The set of natural number itself is countably infinite because there's a bijection between itself, right? From itself to itself and so on. So we know that, um, that this, this, set is, this set is countably, countably infinite. So we have a little bit more and that we say that we say a set is countable, just countable, right? A set is countable, a set S is countable if S is finite or countably infinite. So I think we uh, we should take a break at this point. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, we will take a small short break and we will come back in 15 minutes and talk about other things. Okay, so I will see you in uh, 15 minutes. So let's let us all come back at 7.45. I'll stop the sharing. Sorry, I forgot to stop. I forgot to start recording. Okay. <clears throat> so our claim is that set of integers is, is countable, set of even odd numbers is countable. And my claim is that set of rational numbers is countable. What do you think about it? Do you know what, what are rational numbers? So set of rational numbers is denoted usually but denoted by Q. And this set of rational numbers is, is a set of numbers of the form P divided by Q such that both P and Q are integers, okay? And Q is not equal to zero, okay? And furthermore, GCD of P and Q is equal to one, right? That is, they are the reduced, uh, so all fractions are in, in a reduced form. So, uh, so my claim is that set of rational numbers is counted. What do you think about it? Is Q countable? Yes, set Q is countable. <clears throat> and I can show you why it is countable. And that's basically uh, the Cantor's diagonalization argument. In so what we can do, so just imagine, uh, just suppose we are interested in positive vectors. Because negative numbers are just the additive images of uh, positive numbers. So if we can prove it something for uh, positive numbers, we can always prove it for negative numbers, right? So let's imagine just we are interested in 
positive uh, Rashi. Okay, so we will try to list down. We will list down all possible numbers in the set Q. And if we can come up with a bijection, okay, if we can show that there exists a bijection from set of natural numbers n to q, then q is right. So we know in order to prove that something is countable, we need to come up with such a bijection from set of natural numbers. So how would we uh, come up with a list? So what we would, what what do we do? We say that we try to list down all the fractions. So the first fraction is one over. Okay, one over one is definitely a rational number, and we will grow this uh, sequence of fractions in two directions, either in the right direction and in in the bottom direction. So we said the next fraction that we write is two over one, and the next fraction we write is three over one, and four over one and five over one and so on. Okay, And we can also go down. And when we go down, we just increase the denominator rather than numerator. So when we are going in the right hand direction, we increase the denominator and uh, we increase the numerator and keep the denominator constant. When we go down, we increase the denominator and keep the numerator constant. So one over one, then we would have two over, sorry. 1 over 2, right? Then we have 1 over 3, then we have 1 over 4, and so on and so forth. And we, when we go in the right hand direction, we would have 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2, 5 over 2, and so on. 2 over 3, 3 over 3, 4 over 3, 5 over 3, and so on. Uh, 2 over 4, 3 over 4, 4 over 4, five over four and so on. So we, this set grows in both directions infinitely, right? So it grows infinitely in this direction, infinitely in this direction, infinitely in this direction, and infinitely in this direction, right? It, it grows uh, in this direction. So what we will do now, we would say that we will try to figure out a, a way to list down all these numbers one by one. So the first number that we list down is this one over one. So one over one, we know that it's it's a, it's a rational number. One over one is just one. Okay. Then we will go here in this direction. One over two is also a rational number. Then here, and two over one is also a rational number. Okay. From this, we will come here. Three over one is a rational number. We will come to two over two. Now, two over two is not included in our, in our set of rational numbers because two over two is exactly as one over one. And since one over one is already included, so we will not. So every time we include a new number in our list, we check, have we included that number before or not? If yes, we will not include. If no, then we will. We come down, one over three is a new number, so we include it. Then we come here, we see one over four, it's a new number, so we include it. Then we have two over three, it's, it's a new number, so we include it. Then we have three over two, it's a new number, we include it. Then four over one, then five over one. Then we come to four over two. Four over two is exactly as uh, two over one, which is exactly, I mean, which we already have included here, so we will not include. Uh, then we have three over three. Three over three is exactly as one over one, we already have included, so we are not going to include. Then we have one over two, but one over two has already been included because it's one over uh, two or four is exactly as one over two. So we will not include. Then the new number would be, uh, we know that the new number would be um, one over five. So we will include it and so on and so forth. Okay. And then we will keep track. So my claim is that with this process, with this process, we will list all rational numbers. Who 
one by one and exactly once. No rational number will come twice and we will be able to come up with all numbers. Now you can, you may argue that where is the function f? Where is the bijection? That's very simple. So the bijection is, this is one, this is two, this is three, or if you want to call it, uh, let's say, this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and so on and so forth. So this is a sequence, right? So for every number that we find in set of national num natural numbers, we find a corresponding rational number. And since we are able to list down all rational numbers, so there must exist a bijection. F is definitely a bijection. Therefore, set of rational numbers is countable. Even though it is, even though it is uh, infinite, it is countable. And it seems counterintuitive, but this is countable. Is this thing clear? Okay. So based on this information, I have a question. So are you all familiar with the set R, the set of real numbers? So the question is, is R Just can anyone try? Yes, can anyone? Sir, I think R is not countable. Okay, why? What about others? So there are like at least 16 is too many clear number. What? Can you repeat? But natural numbers is also in. I mean, the set of rational numbers is also in. But that is possible. The Y set of real numbers is not countable. Because it contains fraction. It contains what? I cannot, I cannot uh, understand what you're saying. It contains what? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, irrational numbers are not counted. Yes, so R is, count, is, is, is not countable and Y it is not countable. I will give you an argument, a very simple argument, and I will show you that it is not comfortable. But before that, I just tell you that, uh, suppose A is a countable set. Okay, A is some set which is countable. We do not know whether it's a finite set or an infinite set, but it's just a countable set. And B is a subset of A. Then B is also countable. So every subset of a countable set is countable. Okay. Every subset of a countable set is countable. So, so we have to prove that if R is countable or not. Right? So let us say we have a theorem. It says that R is not countable. So we need to prove that why R is not countable. So let's prove it. 
So the proof is very simple. We say that it's proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction means that we assume the contrary what we need to prove. So we say assume R is concrete. And we will come up with a contradiction which will make us change our assumption that R is not, uh, change our assumption to that R is not. So R is count. So if R is countable, then every subset of R must be countable. So zero one is a subset of the set R, right? So let me rewrite it again very clearly. Set zero one is a subset of set R. Is this in here? So I'm saying set, but I have not written the braces. Right? So, but it is still a set. Why? Because this is an interval. It's an it's a closed interval. So it is a closed interval is basically a set. So this is a set. So if R is countable, then this set zero one is also countable. Right? And if we can prove that this set is not countable, then it means that we come up with a contradiction. Now, imagine any number X that is within this set zero one then this X is between zero and one, right? It is greater than or equal to zero and it is less than or equal to one. So zero is there and one is there and every other number that is between zero and one must be there, okay? So if the set is countable, then we must be able to list down all numbers in the set, right? And all those numbers come as, a, as, as in the format of uh, zero point something, because all those numbers are either greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to, to one. So let's say all those numbers, the list of those numbers is R1, R2, R3, and so on. So we have numbers like R1, R2, R3, okay? I do not know what is R2, I do not know what is R3, but imagine this is a sequence of numbers which are in the interval zero one. And since we do not know what are those R1, R2, so let's imagine this R1 is something like zero, point some digit, okay? Some other digit, some other digit, and so on. Okay, these digits D are between zero and nine. So let's, let's give them some indices. So it's digit one, two, digit one, Sorry, digit one, one, digit one, two, digit one, three, and so on. Similarly, R2 is a number which is zero point digit two, one, two, 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 three, and so on. R3 is a number which is zero point digit three, one, digit three, two, digit three, three, and so on. So these, these indices actually just tell us that which digit we are referring. Okay? So all dij are between zero. And, and nine, right? So these digits are either zero or one or two or three or four and so on, right? Do you, do you understand what we are doing? Do you understand the construction? So what we are doing, we are saying that if we imagine that this set R, uh, this set zero one is countable, then we should be able to come up with a sequencing of these numbers and th that sequence can be called as R1, R2, R3, R4, so on and so forth, where each R, I, would be a number that is between zero and one, such that it is zero point something. And that something is a, is a long sequence of digits because these are uh, all real numbers. So real numbers usually do not end. So this, let's say, suppose it is 0 0.1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, or pi, or e, or, or pi divided by something, and, and so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> So these are all the, the numbers between zero and one. So this thing clear? Is the construction clear? Now my claim is that 
my claim is that this list of numbers or i's is not exhaustive. What do I mean by exhaustive? If the list is exhaustive, it means that every real number that exists between zero and one must be listed down here. And I will prove that it is not the case. I can create a number which is not in this list. And, but that is a number between zero and one. And that's a real number. Therefore, this list is not exhaustive. So no matter how many numbers you include in this list, I can always create a new number which is not in this list. And how can I create this number? So I'm not sure what these these DIs are, right? They could be anything. They could be zeros or ones or twos or threes or fours or whatever. So what do we do? We do a very simple thing. We say that we create a new number. We create a new number. So we create a new number. And how do we create a new number? We say that we create a new number R. That number is zero point D1, D2, D3, and so on. Okay. We would say that this DI is equal to four if DII I is not equal to four. Okay. And we would say that this DI is equal to five if this di i is equal to very simple rule. So this number r only consists of fours and fives. So we will just check over here if this equal if this digit is equal to four or not. If it is equal to four, if it is equal to four, if it is equal to four, we will make this five. If this equal to uh, if this is not equal to four, we will make it four, and so on and so forth. Right. So let's take an example. Just take an example. Imagine that R1, R1 is equal to, let's say, 0 0.2379102. Uh, R2 is equal to uh, 0 0.4590138. We do not know what are the other digits, but just imagine. R3 is. Um, 0 0.0911864 and so on. And R4 is uh, 0 0.8053900. So we can create a new number R, uh, which is equal to uh, 0 0.D1, D2, so on. So let's see what are those D1s, right? So we say that R, so we check this number. Is this equal to four or not? Since it is not equal to four, so it becomes four, right? Right? Right, sorry. So, so, so since uh, this is not equal to four, so this becomes four. If it is equal to five, if it is equal to five, if this number is four, then we make it five. So we just, alternated. So you check this digit, then this digit, then this digit, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so two, which is DII, is not equal to four, so this becomes four. Then two, two is equal to five. Okay, it's equal to five, which means it is not equal to four, so it becomes four, and so on. So we will create a new number here. My claim is that this new number, this new number, is different from all the numbers that we have in the This R differs with R1 at bit one or digit one. With R2 at digit two and so on. So this number R differs from R1, it differs from R2, it differs from R3, it differs from R4 and so on and so forth. So if my claim was that this, this list of R1s, R2s and R3s and R4s was exhaustive, then this new number, which is between one and zero must be in this list. 
But it is not because it is different for all from all those. So it means that this number does not is not included in this list, right? So we one may argue that okay, let's include this number over here. If we include this number here, we can again create a new number which will differ from this number at one position. Okay, and that new number can be included. So this process will never stop. So it means that whatever we do, we will never be able to construct an exhaustive list of all the numbers between zero and one, right? Therefore, we cannot create a bijection from the set of natural numbers to each number in this interval. Therefore, this is not countable. Okay, therefore, set R is not now. Okay, so this is a kind of diagonalization argument given by Cantor to prove that set of rational numbers is countable and then set of real numbers. Okay, with this, I will go back to our ATM result. But we need a few more results before we can prove ATM. And I have a, a result. We call it corollary. This corollary says some languages are not Turing recognizable. Some, TV, some machines are not Turing recognizable. So the proof is very simple. Okay. Uh, but I will, before I give proof, uh, if there is any question. Yes. Any questions? No questions? You can write your question if there's any issue in audio. Okay. <clears throat> so before we go to, to the proof, imagine there is some alpha. Some alpha. It may contain one or two or three or more characters, right? Then we know that sigma star is the set of all possible strings. Right? All possible strings that we can think of are there, right? Definitely with respect to the alphabet sigma. We can make our life easy and we say that, okay, imagine that sigma is zero one, then sigma star is set of all possible, set of all possible binary strings. Right? <clears throat> Right? Okay. Now, my claim is that sigma star is a countable set. Do you agree with that? Why it's a countable set? This is countable set because we can construct a bijection from the set of natural numbers, right? So we say that we know that sigma star contains all bit strings okay, of length zero, then length one, then length two, then length three, and so on. How many bit strings of length zero are there? There is just one bit, bit string of length zero, which is sigma, uh, epsilon. How many 
of length one. There are two strings, zero and one. How many bit strings of length two? There are four strings, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. How many of three? There are eight, right? Zero, 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 one, till one, one, one. So we have eight strings and so on. Since we can list down all of them, we can count them. So let's say this is one, this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on and so on. Since we can count them, therefore it's a countable. So we can create a bijection from set of natural numbers. So sigma star is a countable. Right? Okay. My next claim is the, the set of all possible Turing machines. This company. Why? It's not very easy to see that why it is the case that set of all possible Turing machines is countable. Because for any Turing machine, we can create a description of a Turing machine. And that description of a Turing machine is usually a long string of zeros and ones. Okay. So you can say that, okay, I have a Turing machine and I encoded that Turing machine in a C++ program and I compiled that C++ program and I received a binary file and then binary file is basically just a long string of zeros and one. So we know that every, every Turing machine can be encoded into a long string of zeros and ones. We know that whatever is the description of Turing machine, it must belong to Sigma star. Because Sigma star contains all possible strings of zeros and ones, and this is again just a string of zeros and one. So that must belong to the set sigma star. If sigma star is countable, then we know that set of all possible descriptions of all possible Turing machine must be a subset of sigma star. Therefore, set of all possible Turing machine is also countable. Right? Right or wrong? Now, the punchline. The set of all possible languages is uncountable. Set of all strings is countable, but set of all possible languages over some some sigma is uncountable. Okay, set of all possible languages is uncountable. Why it is the case? Because there are infinitely many different possible languages. So imagine this is sigma star. Sigma star contains epsilon, it contains zero, it contains one, it contains zero, zero, uh, zero, one, one, zero, one, uh, and, and one, one, then zero, 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 and so on. So all possible bit string, so bit string of length zero, bit string of length one, one, two, 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 and so on. Now, what is a language? A language is basically a subset of, subset of, how many subsets of this sigma stars exist? Infinite. Huge number, infinite. It's not just infinite. In, in, we know that infinite could be countable. It's not just infinite. And it, it is basically two power so how do we so how do you find out the possible subset? You you find out using the power set, right? So you have to find out the power set, uh, power set of power set of sigma star. And the power set of six since sigma star is in itself 
an infinite set, then power set of any infinite set is uncountable. Uh, I'm not going to prove that why this the gate, but we, we can prove it using a uh, diagonalization argument, exactly the same kind of argument that we gave uh, for um, the set of real. So we, we proved that set of real number is uncountable. So we can give exactly the same thing. So we can imagine that, imagine, assume that this set is countable. And if, if this set is countable, we can list down all possible language as language one, language two, language three, and so on and so forth. Then we can create a new language L, which differ from each of these languages at, in at least one step. And that language will be a language. And according to our understanding, that must be one of the subsets from the Sigma star, but that is not from uh, the list of subsets that we just included. Therefore, it's a new language, right? So if we include it, then we again will be able to create a new, a new language and so on. So we would prove that, this way we'll prove that the power set of Sigma star is now, so all possible languages, the set of all possible languages is uncountable. And set of all possible Turing machines is countable. It means that there are more languages than all Turing machines together can recognize or define. Therefore, there are many other languages which cannot be recognized or decided by any of them. Because it is impossible. We cannot, we cannot construct any machine which can recognize it. Therefore, some languages are not even Turing recognized. So we cannot construct a decider for them. We cannot construct a recognizer for them because it's simply impossible to create uh, a Turing machine because there are not enough ways to create Turing machines which can, uh, which can uh, construct, which can recognize all, all these. So you can imagine that, let's say, the number of particles in, in the entire universe Imagine uh, that every particle in this universe is one Turing machine, right? Then the number of languages then each of these particles can recognize is exactly the number of particles. Now we prove that there are uncountably many more languages which could exist. And since we cannot recognize any of those languages because we have already exhausted, exhausted all the possibility of constructing any language. So there are more languages that can be then can be created uh, than the Turing machines which recognize. So this is a negative result, and this result will be used in order to prove that ATM is uncountable. So we will use this result to prove that ATM is uncountable. Okay, is this in clear? I think we can end this lecture here. In the next lecture, we will talk about the proof of this result. And that proof is basically also called the halting problem. If you're interested, you can read it before the class. Uh, but we will talk about this in the next lecture. So I think that's all for today. Okay, uh, the list of uh, the list of topics for the next quiz are everything that we have covered after the second quiz till today. Okay, so what did we cover after the quiz number two? We covered the side of and these results that we covered today and diagonalization and other things. And we also covered, uh, last time we covered um, things like Turing uh, decidable, Turing recognizable, and, and such definitions. Okay, uh, so that's all for today. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Sir, I, uh, I had a request. Uh, can you please check your chat? Um, yes, trash Turing thesis will be included. And next class will be on campus. No, next class will not be on campus. We will not have classes on campus before E. Uh, 
because for me it's, it's difficult to commute uh, in these days due to e there is some issues with driving and everything so i cannot drive uh, i cannot come to campus and it's really cumbersome to use Uber and other things so i cannot drive uh, at least till e i don't have my car accessible to me and it will be accessible it will be available after e so i cannot come to campus Uh, so, Mohammed Arif, uh, Mohammed Ali Iqbal, yes, I, I got it. I received the email. Uh, I will think about it. Okay, any other question? No, in that case, uh, let's end this lecture here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you again on Thursday, and we will have a small quiz. And before we start, thank you, sir. So the quiz is on Thursday in the, in the first 10, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And this time the quiz will be a little bit different. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, it will be online and uh, you don't have to write anything. It will be just a form. Um, and uh, you can answer it in, in the form. It will be completely online. Thank you, sir. Okay, can you practice for the quiz? You can practice for the quiz by by attending my lectures and uh, reading the book. And uh, yeah, it, it would be something like MCQs and other things. Very short answer. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any other question, you can send me an email and we can talk. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Take care. Bye.